like to start things off by wishing everyone a happy Thanksgiving. And each year at this time, we typically have a talk about what we're thankful for. And I'm going to share one of the things I'm thankful for today in chess, and that is absolutely clean, simple, straightforward opening ideas. And we're going to be going back to one of the old school chess streamers, the people who were doing streaming before streaming became unbelievably popular during this pandemic. Chess bra Eric Hansen is going to be playing white here. And I actually came across this idea because I was following the chess bra stream when Eric was playing a title Tuesday and he referenced this line and I liked it so much I looked it up in the database and found that he'd had a few games with it and I'd like to showcase one of those games here and uh, I think you're gonna enjoy it so this is from the Sicilian Night Orf and the thing about the Night Orf and my E4 players know the Sicilian has played one in three games in chess Worldwide, statistically, it, it is so extremely popular. So having straightforward and simple ways to play against it, I believe is important, especially if you just need a side variation. Because typically I recommend my students to, to go after the Sicilian. I mean, if you're going to play an open Sicilian, play an open Sicilian. But we also need secondary systems, things that we can use to confuse opponents and just put them away. And really like the classical approach. Simple, effective, and after knight b3, let's get to a topical position. Now, I'm going to show you when you just follow the moves in the database, this is the typical line that you see played over and over and over. Bishop e3, bishop e6, and we'll stop here just for a moment and talk about the fact that Black has two natural moves in the position that he's wanting to make. B5 and D5. D5 is, is a critical break. And you see this across multiple Sicilians. When black has this pawn structure, white typically wants to maintain, maintain control over D5. Very, very important. So, queen D2, A4 to restrict B5, A5 to really lock it down and possess that B6 square. Rook FD1, keeping an eye on D5. All this seems natural, but then Queen E1, and then Bishop F3, okay, D5 again, that makes sense. And after H6, we're kind of jumbled here. So Knight C1, and Queen C7, keeping an eye on the A pawn again, Knight D3, and D5. So the main line, and when we end the position in the database, black scores slightly better than white here, Black gets his natural break. And the thing I like about what Eric played, after rook e1, bishop e6, bishop f3, it plays directly against this d5 break idea. And we're going to see a better organization of the white pieces for an overall cleaner and easier game to play. So let's keep it going. Knight bd7, black's doing Mr. Natural, putting all of his pieces where they need to go. a4 again, restricting b5 and subsequent play. And now already, we're going to see an idea that often you'll get from another Sicilian. And just for reference with the pawn structure, let's go ahead and see that it happens in these lines, where d6, e5, we have the same pawn structure. And you find that around here, we'll do this line, you play a move like c3, so this knight has a root to come back to support a knight on d5. So coming back to this point after queen c7, we're going to see the same type of idea from the b3 knight. Knight d2, knight f1, knight e3. And now we've really cemented control over d5. Like I said, 
we've got this very clean, straightforward, I'm playing against the D5 break idea. And it really made an impression on me. I'm like, okay, anytime it's straightforward, I understand it. And then when you check it with the engine, it's good. That's that's all I need. This this is now going to be one of those staples. I rarely play E4, but I could definitely see myself playing this type of line. Bishop D8, making sense. Bishop D2, just getting getting everybody working. Best square he can have right now. And give that bishop a tickle. Rook C1, and you're going to see the plan pop up very soon here. Rook F8, and this is one of the first deviations I would have from the game because white has got maximum potential here. Now we need to start playing for our plan. And Eric slow plays in the game with b3, but I think making the commitment knight c to d5 right here, it's the time to do it. Because, for instance, after bishop takes, pawn takes, c4, and after queen c2, you can see the entire queenside pawn mass is moving forward and getting work done here where white has some edge. But in the main game, nothing's pitched by any means with b3. b5 gets this reaction from black. And now there's that weak a6 pawn we can work against. So b3 had its merits mostly based off of how black responded to it. Now knight c to d5, and we get the same kind of play. Queen a7, eyeing the potential weakness on f2 and the white king. So, defense. Rook e5, and it looks like black's getting some initiative, so we need to hit targets of our own. So we're going to come back to that weakened pawn that we were focusing on earlier. And bishop takes a6. And knight takes e3. And this is a critical moment. If you're a bit of a calculator, now's the time to pause the video and white to play. See if you can figure out what Eric did. And let's keep going. So, Eric in the main game decided to go bishop takes e3 and trade down a bit. But after having the benefit of hindsight and engine use. Bishop takes c8, seems more forcing and will reach an easily winning ending after knight takes, rook takes, bishop takes, rook takes, knight f6, where the bishop pair in the open position is going to be more than enough, and the outside pass b pawn has got to be helping here. But in the main game, Bishop takes e3 was played, and now rook d8, leaving all the tension in the position, and bishop c4, anchoring the bishop and keeping an eye on f7 seems like a good way to go to break up the queen and bishop battery. Then we go bishop f4 to keep the bishop pair, and that pawn's going to fall. So that seemed like a little improvement. Bishop f4 was played immediately in the game. And after rook f5, black has gotten to dynamic equality and should try to pile up more on f2 with, say, knight f6 here. And notice how there's no discoveries from the bishop that black has to worry about after knight f6 because pretty much everything of importance is on dark squares. But black got a little antsy here and played bishop takes f2. And maybe because it's moved 28... Uh, one or both players were in time trouble. I'm not quite sure of if this was an increment type game. Well, it's got to be increment if it's speed A, but if it was a move 30, move 40, it's different in different tournaments when you get added time. So bishop takes f2, rook takes, rook takes, and bishop e2, where any discovery by the rook Checking the white king is going to end in taking the queen on a7. So black decides to give the lady and reach this position. And this is already a, a critical position because it's move, move 31. And this is another pause and try to figure it out. 
what is the best move for white? Okay, hopefully you paused and figured it out. Now, this is one of those positions that I would expect to see when I'm doing uh, puzzles on chess.com. And the rook on e2 is almost out of squares. So we could simply go queen d1, and now after rook e3, where are you going? Where the rook has got a sack for the bishop, and queen versus rook and knight should be an easy mop up. But what happens in the game after queen c3, we end up getting a situation where the bishop is going to have to be given for the e-pawn, and we're going to reach a roughly equal position. Like when you turn on the engine here, engine's already going, eh, you know, whatever, zeros. This is just craziness, though. And we're going to quickly go through the rest of the game, and we're halfway there at move 41. <laughs> so we're going to see how you can make the most out of this type of ending. And the queen can work the rooks as long as the rooks don't coordinate. The queen needs to always be mindful of the king's safety and to exploit the other king's lack of safety. So queen c4 and luft. Pass pawns must be pushed. An important guy talked about that once. Pin the rook, making it harder to coordinate. And this pawn has gotten far up the board, causing black to still stay uncoordinated and white has time to improve. So c4 is a nice move. If rook takes b7, queen e4 and drop skis of the rook. So king g7. And now after c5, the pawn does fall, but double attack, hitting the g-pawn and the rook on b7, which is going to ruin the cover of the black king. So... One of the technique things in this type of ending is we could take the h-pawn straight away here. But if you can do it in two or do it in ten moves, you want to elect to do it in ten moves, especially if you can do it relatively quickly and make your opponent think. And this is a principle that Silman talked about in the complete endgame course from beginner to master. I believe in the master chapter... He kicks it off with the concept of cat and mouse and working the opponent. So it never hurts to test the waters, and make a bunch of peace moves without making committal moves with capturing or pawn moves in many endings. So keep that in mind from a technique standpoint. So queen e5 check, queen f4, and the f pawn, which is far more important than the h pawn, falls. And we're going to continue to poke and prod. Queen e4. Making sure that the rook isn't going to come to f2. Only now queen f3 since the rooks are disconnected, allowing us to push the pawn. And notice, with the queen on f3, we're always holding that g2 pawn. Check, check. And you just keep checking. Finally decide to take the pawn. And this is admitting that we're losing the C pawn, but we still have the two connected passers. So it's very logical liquidation. And let's see how the pawn phalanx moves forward. Again, the queen being on e5 is anchoring that g pawn. You protect your base pawn, you're protecting your king. And we're not ever really giving time for black to fully coordinate to sack properly. I mean, if black just had one more move here, rook takes g3 would be a draw. But queen e3, none of that. Queen f4, none of that. You cannot take the g pawn. And after queen f6 check, it's a bit of a problem scenario here. Because if king h7, queen takes g5, and we've got the, the two for none special. And that's going to do it. 
And if rook seven g6, that's all she wrote with queen h8 mate. And a very, very nice game by Grandmaster Hansen.